Good afternoon and good morning, depending on where you are across the United States. Welcome to the collaborative webinar, uh, excuse me, collaborative mentoring webinar series, and thank you for joining us today. Today we'll be talking about fighting toxic relationships with healthy ones, mentoring youth who experience commercial sexual exploitation. I'm Dusty Ann North from the California Mentoring Partnership, and I'll be facilitating today's conversation. Let's get started. This webinar is part of the Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series, which is funded by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention through the National Mentoring Resource Center and facilitated in partnership with Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership. These webinars would not be possible without the planning team, which includes the mentoring partnerships shown on this slide. In addition to this webinar series, the NMRC provides resources for mentoring practitioners. At the end of this webinar, we'll provide more details about how you can access this no-cost support. Before we get started, I wanted to share some housekeeping information. In one week, you'll receive an email with information about how to download a copy of these slides and view the webinar recording. <clears throat> you can also access this information directly by going to Mentor's website in the next week. And to continually improve the series, we're looking for your input. <clears throat> a short survey will pop up as you exit the webinar. Please take three minutes to give us your feedback. We want this to be a participatory experience, so please use the question box to ask questions throughout the webinar. Jerry Shirk from the California Mentoring Partnership will be queuing up questions to share with panelists during the Q&A portion of the webinar. We may not get to all questions because there are several hundred of you on the webinar, but we will do our best. The questions that we share with our panelists are generally ones that broaden or deepen the conversation. First, to get a sense of who is with us today, we have two short polls. So our first poll is, what is your experience level in the mentoring field, beginner, experienced, or expert? So this is a good chance to practice using the tools in our uh, webinar system, so go ahead and select one of those and we'll get to see our results in just a second. All right, it looks like we have, uh, it looks like we have a lot of experienced folks today. Over half of you uh, are very experienced. A few of you are experts, and we have also about almost 40% of you consider yourself beginners. So welcome to everyone, whatever level you're at. We are uh, excited to talk with you about today's um, topic. And a second poll here is we want to know a little bit more about your role in the mentoring field. And some of you may be uh, more than one of these, but just pick the one that you feel most describes who you are and what you do in our field. All right, looks like we have the largest number of you are practitioners, um, a few researchers, some technical assistance providers, one or two funders, and then ooh, almost 40% of you are other. And uh, it's hard to know exactly what that means, but we do have another poll that's going to help us understand some of that, um, perhaps. So let's go to our next poll. Uh, it's not a poll that you have to take now. It's one that you actually took when you registered. Um, for the session. So because this is such an important topic um, and one that our services fields are still learning to address, we asked you to complete a poll during registration about your experience levels with mentoring and with addressing um, commercial sexual exploitation of children. And here were the results that we got. And as you can see, we have quite a lot of expertise coming together today, both on the mentoring front and on, this, on the um, front of youth exploitation. And some folks who are new to both topics, um, some more one than the other, et cetera. So you can see those re results here. So we want you to know that our presenters will speak to all of those levels of experience. And um, we always like for these webinars to be very interactive, but today we hope you'll make an extra effort to post any of your comments, resources, ideas, thoughts, anything that you think would further the conversation. The chat box is a great place to do that. And because we have such interesting different kinds of expertise coming together today. We want to extra encourage that kind of participa uh, participation in the chat box. And you could even start now just by um, putting in the chat box just your name and 
to your organization and saying hello to everyone. So feel free to go ahead and introduce yourself by chat. Welcome everybody. Uh, so I just wanted to give a little bit of background about myself um, and my interest in today's topic. So um, I am Destiny Ann North and I'm the research director and a TA provider for the California Mentoring Partnership. Um, I do a lot of training and technical assistance for the youth mentoring field and, and other related youth services fields, and I've been at that since 1995. I have a strong focus on youth families and transition-aged youth in high distress, so uh, often youth involved in child welfare, homeless and runaway youth, justice involved, extreme poverty, et cetera. Uh, I have my doctorate, so I do a lot of bridging research and practice towards quality evidence-based services. I'm also a lecturer and researcher at the UC Berkeley School of Social Welfare. And as I said, I'm the research director for the California Mentoring Partnership. Really happy to be here today. And um, this is a really important uh, topic, as I said, and, and one that's close to my heart because it's one that um, greatly affects a lot of the youth that I work with. So, um, so really happy to be here. I wanted to tell you a little bit more about we hope, what we hope we'll accomplish today. So we're hoping that you'll come away today having heard uh, a youth-centered um, perspective and survivor-centered perspective on both problems and solutions related to the commercial and sexual exploitation of children, which is also known as CSEX. So you'll hear that acronym throughout the session today. We hope that you'll gain new awareness of the relational aspects of exploitation and a greater ability to leverage the unique role that mentors can play in assisting youth to resist and recover. So really looking at a relational understanding of both the problem and its solution. Uh, we hope to build an improved understandings of the role of trauma in exploitation and in the development of youth who experience it. Also the importance of trauma-informed mentoring for youth who have been or are at risk of being exploited. We're gonna try to learn some strategies to better utilize a strengths-based approach that is driven by the youth affected by the problem. And we also really want to consider how to address toxic, toxicity in the cultural and economic environment that perpetuates youth exploitation. So rather than just addressing uh, individuals and helping individuals adapt, we're hoping to also look at how we can work on the environment that, that uh, perpetuates exploitation as well. So that's what we're hoping to get out of today. No, nothing big here, just a few small things. It sounds kind of lofty, but I think we'll get at a lot of this. So really looking forward to the discussion that's coming. Just a couple more words about CSEC um, and why it's important to talk about. These are just a few stats to show us why this uh, problem is important. Clearly, a lot of youth are affected. Um, it's a $32 billion industry, according to one source. Um, could affect up to 100,000 children per year, two to 300,000 at risk every year. It's the most profitable industry in the world, which is frightening. Um, and important also to know that an extremely high percentage of youth who are exploited also experienced other sorts of abuse or neglect, uh, often sexual, prior to exploitation. So there's a huge overlap between child welfare systems and other, um, other intervention systems with uh, exploitation. Okay, moving along. <clears throat> um, but before we get any further in the discussion, I think it's important to, to be clear about what we mean when we talk about youth ex exploitation. So this is a legal definition of um, commercial sexual exploitation of children, or CSEC, provided by the U.S. Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. And so they say that, uh, uh, that CSEC is a range of crimes and activities involving the sexual abuse or exploitation of a child for the financial benefit of any person or in exchange for anything of value, which could be monetary or non-monetary, given or received by any person. So some, some examples here include trafficking in child prostitution, child sex tourism, commercial production of child pornography, um, child sexual activity in exchange for anything of value, and the online transmission of video of that, internet-based marriage brokering and early marriage, and children performing in sex venues are just some examples. 
Um, and we wanted to say that this definition is useful as it shows that exploitation can take many forms, including the examples here, and there are others, that are illegal. However, it's important to also note that even these don't capture every possible situation and that many forms of exploitation may not rise to the level of criminality, but are nonetheless still harmful. So there may be exploitive aspects of young people's relationships or situations that are inappropriate and damaging to them but may not rise to the level of <clears throat> the legal definition. And then it's also critical to understand that youth affected by these actions by adults may or may not view their experiences, experiences and situations as exploitive and that they may have their own strong views and opinions that deserve respect about this issue. So it's important to define the topic that we're talking about but also understand that those definitions look very different from law enforcement to service providers to youth themselves, et cetera. So we have to be really careful about how we approach this topic. Next slide. Um, so one of the ways we can do that, <clears throat> one of the ways we can be careful not to make assumptions about the youth that are affected by exploitation and that we can allow people with relevant histories to identify themselves rather than labeling them is to distinguish the problem of youth exploitation from the populations that are affected. So the social problem we are trying to address today is that of commercial sexual exploitation of young people. And that problem concerns everyone. Any young person can be victimized. But the populations that are most vulnerable to exploitation include youth who experience homelessness, out-of-home placement, justice system involvement, undocumented status, among others, and have experienced previous abuse. So today's content addresses considerations and strategies for mentoring survivors of exploitation as well as young people who are particularly at risk. And youth and adults with these experiences are important voices in our discussion of the problem. So we just wanna be clear about, um, we can address the problem of exploitation and there are multiple voices that, that come to bear in addressing that problem. So with all of that said, I'd like to introduce our panelists today. Um, <clears throat> and I'm so pleased um, and excited to have these esteemed folks join us. Today, So first, I am honored to introduce Carissa Phelps, who is an attorney, an author, and an advocate. She is the author of Runaway Girl, Escape, Escaping Life on the Streets, One Helping Hand at a Time. She's also the founder of Runaway Girl, Inc., a social purpose corporation, which aims to create employment opportunities through the teachable moments and lived experiences that make up our lives. They offer survivors opportunity to learn, grow, connect, and earn through a robust consulting and training platform. And they also educate and prepare first responders, interventionist, intervention specialists who see human trafficking and want to respond in a way that creates a path to freedom for all victims and survivors. And Carissa has now partnered with Eric Bauer, who helped to lead, lead the fight to take down Backpage. Their law firm, Bauer & Phelps, focuses on civil claims related to human trafficking and brings together decades of experience serving clients and advocating on behalf of survivors and victims of sex trafficking and sexual abuse. So welcome, Carissa. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our next panelist, who I'm equally thrilled to introduce, is Sky O'Neill Adrian, who is a 23-year-old pro-LGBTQ policy consultant based in New York, but Jamaican born and raised. Unfortunately, in 2015, due to his parents' inability to care for him, Sky was forced into homelessness. He later that year discovered Ali Forney Center where he had reached both crisis shelter and transitional housing. He later joined the AFC advocacy team where he got training in a range of skills to work with young people. And four years later, he sits as the lead organizer at Fierce NYC, chair and policy consultant on the New York Coalition on the Continuum of Care Youth Action Board and consultant at Youth Collaboratory through the Youth Catalyst team. He also serves as a consultant with the National LGBTQ Research Team, and in his spare time, he enjoys reading reports and novels, playing tennis, and traveling. Welcome, Sky. We are thrilled to have you today. And finally, I am also pleased to welcome Kendon Elliott, who is Technical Assistance Manager of Youth Collaboratory. Kendon leads Youth Collaboratory's technical assistance for the OJJDP Specialized Services and Mentoring for Youth Survivors of CSEC Initiative. He has also facilitated the Youth Catalyst team. Kendon has walked alongside people, young people as an activist, foster parent, mentor, teacher, and learner, and has held various positions in direct practice and systems change work. 
He focuses his energy on projects that center the voices of young people most impacted by homelessness, trafficking and exploitation, as well as foster care, juvenile justice, <clears throat> mental health and other systems to create real solutions and systems change. And um, I wanted to mention also, if we can go back to um, Sky's slide for just a second, um, one of his main projects is the Coalition for Homeless Youth, which is a consortium of 60 plus agencies to improve the housing and mental health uh, mental health care continuum for 50,000 runaway homeless and street involved youth throughout New York State. And uh, a little bit more about Youth Collaboratory, if we can go back to Kendon's slide. They harness the power of youth services community to innovate, evaluate, and drive effective strategies that assure safety and well-being of youth and young adults, unlocking their limitless potential. So that gives you an idea who we have with us today, quite a powerhouse of amazing uh, voices. Uh, in my opinion, so I hope you're as excited as I am. And um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to highlight the, the main themes that we're hoping to address today. Anytime we do a webinar that is about mentoring for a particular high needs population, there's always so many different directions we could go with it and so much information to, to think about. So we decided that these were some themes we could really address and highlight today. Um, so the first is relationships as key to both exploitation and the solutions to exploitation, both in terms of prevention and recovery. Um, so really wanna highlight that relational piece and we think that's especially of course relevant to mentoring, but also just really important for um, addressing the social problem. Um, the second is the role of trauma and trauma-informed ap approaches. And the third is taking that strength-based approach and that youth and survivor-driven orientation. Um, and as we talk about all of these, we, again, we really want to keep in mind how to address environmental toxicity, both at the individual level for, for individual mentees, but also at the, at the sort of broader society level. Um, so, the, so these are kind of our main themes that we hope will come out today. And if we can go to the next slide, you can see how we're planning to tackle it. We're going to talk first about relationships, then about trauma, and then about um, strengths-based and youth survivor-driven mentoring. Then we'll have some time for questions. And this question about, in, about addressing the environmental issues related to um, exploitation will be sort of woven throughout all of those topics, and we'll have some closing thoughts about them at the end. So that's our plan for today. And with that, we're ready to dive into our first topic and start hearing from our panelists. So. We thought it, a good place to start might be hearing from Sky and Carissa about how relationships have been important to their experiences in terms of the risks of exploitation and in overcoming these challenges. So let's start with Sky. Welcome to our session, Sky. Can you tell us a little bit about the importance of relationships in your experiences? Sure, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I don't think anybody could have done that better. That was really, really great. Um, I feel super, super special. Um, but yeah, I won't waste any too much time um, speaking about like why relationships and mentoring young people with experience are especially important. Um, because as mentioned before, I immigrated here in 2015. Um, and from the very small interactions that I had with a few people that I had met at Ali Forney Center, I had gotten two different responses about how to go about dealing with my issue. Um, one particular issue is like housing. Um, as a young person experiencing homelessness, you're actively always thinking about where it is that you're going to spend the night to like sleep if it is that you're not staying in the shelter or the shelter is just overcrowded and you're not able to access it. So one young person told me, oh, you should go on one of those gay dating apps like Jackson Grinder, um, not realizing that it was underlying sexual exploitation that I would be putting myself up to if I were to choose that option. And then one of the young person was like, well, if AFC is full, there's other drop-in programs that you could go to that you don't have to sexually exploit yourself to get somewhere to sleep. But that goes to show how relationships are especially important because just as how one relationship can lead me into this direction, feeding into sexual exploitation, another relationship can feed me away from that. However, what it did on the flip side is to give you more than one option saying that this is not the only option, there's different ways about how it is that you can, you know, try to fix this issue or try to resolve this issue. 
but it goes to show how relationships can either make it either or, and we always want it to be a positive interaction as opposed to a negative interaction or pushing young people into a sex, sex, sexual ex exploitation like you know option. So that's why to me I think you know relationships are important uh, because they withhold the sense of power if it is that you are not directing a young person directly how much of an impact that relationship can cause. Really great insight. Thank you, Stay. Great to hear about that. <clears throat> um, Carissa, how about you? Could you talk a little bit from your own experience and also give us some of your thoughts about best practices for mentoring youth affected by CSEC? Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks for sharing that important experience. It's so critical. And you had those two options so clearly in front of you from a peer relationship, it sounds like. And I know we're not going to talk about that specifically, but that really points out the importance of peer mentorship and the peer relationships if there are people who are building those programs out there. Um, how critical it is that, you know, these were two people that were peers that had a great influence. Um, and for, for my own experience, um, it was definitely relationships that helped me to grow and heal. Uh, I had, I had strong, strong peer relationships that built up over time. And I also had positive influence of people who cared about me um, and showed me that they cared in the ways that they could and really expanded my view of the world and my trust in humanity. Um, and that's kind of what I'll talk more about and my own practice, because it really is a practice of being a mentor uh, in this space, how it's been and how it's developed through my own experiences. So if we um, wanted to jump right in to, to the relationship part. Yeah, please. Okay. So for, for me, my experience um, in terms of how I was helped, it could have been in a moment of time, um, and I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is from the person who is at the front desk of a, of a drop-in center or any, any level um, of connection with your organization or program, that it could be so important of um, how somebody relates to you in that role and sees you, and it really gives you a reflection of who you are. So um, for me, it was one small helping hand at a time. It wasn't um, a single program that helped me. It was definitely the people who were there that helped me. And originally when I published my book, Runaway Girls, the longer title and the hardcover, some of you might know this, is escaping life on the streets one helping hand at a time and that's really my story was that it was not about um, a single event although there were large events that happened that helped me um, and many important people who are part of my story that helped me it was it was really one helping hand at a time so sometimes I think we think that a youth is covered oh yeah they have a mentor oh yeah they're taken care of they have someone they can rely on but it's really all of us uh, it's a combined effort that we weave together, really. So in terms of, of where, <clears throat> where people saw me is where I was. I wasn't, um, when I was first seen and someone heard my story, I was locked up in juvenile hall, and it took somebody asking the right questions and having me write a journal to really hear my story. And then from there, really tried to take the way that I viewed myself and turn it instead of into just a problem focus to uh, solution focus. And they weren't trying to fix me directly and say, you know, here's, here's everything you need to do. It was much more about just hearing where I was, who I was, what I was facing. And at that point in my life, when I was arrested sitting in juvenile hall with a history of um, CSEC, commercial sexual exploitation, of course, did not call it that then. Um, I was viewed as a child prostitute. Um, it, when I was sitting in juvenile hall with that story, there weren't many people who were just trying to get to know me. So I can't emphasize enough how important it is just to meet youth where they are uh, and not come in with a prescription. Just hear, hear where they are. So, you know, I had an arrest record. I had unaddressed trauma from my family. I was disconnected from my family. I'd been a runaway. Um, I had a strong need for belonging, <clears throat> need for belonging, which we'll talk about more. 
Um, and then I was behind in school, so I didn't believe that I could get anywhere. And someone, some of you out there <clears throat> might hear that and be like, <clears throat> that's so much, it's a lot. And you can imagine the youth sitting there with all those things that they're facing. <clears throat> so what I suggest is reframing on your own as you're, as you're sitting with someone and learning who they are and what they've been through. Really try to reframe. Um, and I did it kind of A's first because I think they go A to Z what youth are going through. They're, they're, there's a whole list of things that we're going through when you're meeting us where we are at. Um, but really try to reframe it into something that can be actionable um, and have an impact. So if I'm feeling abandoned, um, attacked, I'm angry, I've, I've been arrested, and we could just go down the list, I'm feeling, I'm feeling dumb, I'm feeling unloved, I'm feeling rejected, this is really how I'm feeling. This can't just be taken away um, from me instantly. So in terms of what you can do as a mentor and how you interact when you're out there doing this work. I'm, being present is, is huge, but being interested and asking for updates on close personal relationships, um, this is something that in my own story, uh, a teacher's aide, she would ask me about family members, what was going on, who was doing what, and, and sometimes you know we have those updates. Even if we've been in foster care group home or disconnected, and it helps for us to be able to know that someone cares about our personal relationships um, and is just not dismissing them, even if they're messy and they're abusive um, relationships that we've we've come from. Um, and then and then presenting different opportunities for therapeutic intervention. So I think that we um, underestimate the power of you know our activity. Just getting someone into like an exercise class or some, you know, I go to the gym with youth that I'm mentoring, um, go on walks and talk, uh, different types of environments that they can go into, um, cooking classes if they're interested in that. There's all types of ways and places where you can offer opportunities for therapeutic intervention that isn't necessarily giving a prescription for therapy and saying, um, go get fixed, right? but instead just giving opportunities for, for growth and learning. And in terms of um, the youth sharing on their own terms, I, I sometimes hear mentors start asking a lot of questions really fast, and that can be embarrassing. It could be embarrassing. It could feel like um, you're trying to find things wrong about me, and I know you might be trying to help me. <clears throat> Maybe even you're trying to connect me with resources and services, but I may not. I'm, I may not be comfortable telling you all of the things that I'm really truly concerned about. So think about connecting them up with an attorney, a nonprofit organization that can help with things like the expungement and vacatures and, and the things that you may not need to go into so much detail with them about and they may feel embarrassed and ashamed about. Um, they don't have to tell you all of those details to get help. All they need to say is, um, I think I want help with this and that should be enough. Um, I've gone with youth to enroll in school, so, you know, it's just an assumption sometimes when someone is not in school that they don't want to go to school, but if it takes a little bit of encouragement or breaking down a barrier to go into an actually enroll in school, uh, you, you, you usually figure out why when you get there because you get there and you meet the front staff who really don't know how to, um, they haven't been in this training, right? They haven't learned all the interactions of, of, of how to um, engage with CSEC youth, and hopefully we will be getting into more and more schools, all of you who are out there doing trainings, and train people at that front staff about when a youth who's experiencing either homelessness or um, not able to feel engaged or, or feel like they're behind in school when they come back to enroll in school, that they could be welcomed and, um, and given the steps to be able to do that. But going in with them is a great first step. And this helps, all of it helps to address, I think, this deeper need for belonging that we all have. Um, and so coming back to who we are as humans and what we need, uh, if they're disconnected, if they're not in school, if they're not um, out engaged in activities, if they're um, feeling like they don't belong, then they're at more risk for, I think, the trafficking happening again. So reframing. <clears throat> and then in terms of how you do that, um, just remembering that you're a role model 
at all times. I think mentor is, is such a, it's such an honor to be a mentor and it's really not a title you can give yourself. It's something that you earn. It's something that the youth looks to you and decides you are their mentor. Uh, you don't, you don't come in and, and kind of give yourself that designation, I don't think. And those of you who are experienced and done this for a while probably know that you can be titled a peer mentor, or even a mentor, but you, you really, when you're engaged in, you earn that role. And it's when they refer to you as a mentor that you feel it the most. But at all times, I think staying above the line in terms of you know, how you engage your, you are who you are. And I think the most important thing that we can all remember when we're being a mentor is that the youth needs that. They need that exposure to who we are as human beings and core, that our core, who we are. And they need to trust that consistency um, and being a role model. And we don't have to try to be somebody that we're not to be a great, a great mentor. Now to the more yes. Yeah, I was thank you so much. And I know you have a few more slides and definitely want to let you close up your thoughts where um I had meant to mention to the audience earlier that we have more slides than usual for a session of this length because our presenters really wanted to make sure that you have a lot of good information. So we may move quickly through some slides or even skip some for time purposes, but we hope that you'll all look at the slides again later. So Carissa, we've got about two or three more, or, yeah, we've got about two or three more minutes for this part for you. Thanks so much. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, you could sign, sign up for the eight hour training. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but when when a youth, um, so, so again, meeting them where they're at, these are the common things that I think that our youth can sometimes feel and, and we know that they're feeling it and we don't understand it. So I just want mentors to be prepared for it. So this belief that he or she will love me more than anyone else can ever love me. And this is when they're, they have this attachment and bond to a trafficker, which is not every case, but could be in some cases. So going to Maslow's hierarchy of needs and understanding where that comes from. And again, that that is very familiar. We all understand that. We understand that that is a core need for belonging and love that we have. Um, and then I like this Maslow's hierarchy of need t needs um, turned on its side a little bit. So this next slide, uh, I really like the way that it shows, and you can go back to it for more detail, but it, it really shows a long personal development time, um, what those needs are and when they're increasing the most. So if we think about the studies that I, I included as handouts, uh, the time of when sexual exploitation is usually happening is usually the time when there's the most increase for love and belonging, the increased need for love and belo belonging is there. There's still significant physiological and safety needs as well that may not be being met. So when you're thinking about what we're meeting in terms of meeting the needs as mentors um, and when children are being exposed and most at risk for entering into commercial sexual exploitation, um, I think it's critical to think of Maslow's turned over like this along the personal development. Um, and then there's the several studies on the next slide that kind of show there's there's a range. And whether it's 12 years old or 11 years old of entry or an average age of 19 years old or 15.8 years old, I mean, it all, it all of all the studies, um, and again, it's on that next slide if you want to go to it, but all those studies um, show that we're in this space where there's this exponential needs starting to grow for love and belonging and we have a high we also have a combined high need for physiological and safety needs so think about you know what you're what you're trying to meet there it's, it's a it's a lot um and in terms of other things that you'll hear i included some more slides i don't know if we're going to have time for all of them but you'll have them available to you and to share more notes on them if um needed Wonderful. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, thank you. And we'll be excited to hear from you again in a few minutes. Um, want to go ahead and turn now to uh, kick it back to Sky and also Kendon um, for some additional thoughts about uh, promoting healthy relationships in mentoring with youth who are exposed to exploitation. So, Kendon and Sky. Hi, guys. Um, this is Sky again. Um, and Kendon, I know that we had discussed how we want to do this, but I think what I could do is that I could just go ahead and start. 
um, with like just lightly explaining this stuff, um, and then you can just pick up from wherever I may have left off or kind of like put in anything that I haven't put in myself. All right, so understanding young people's needs. All right, so I mean, I'm glad that I put like cultural connection. Um, and when I say that, I, I say that meaning like um, also when you're working with young people with these kind of experiences, you want to ensure that the staff are not only culturally reflective, but can also have experience to loop into this young person's experience as well. Um, because for myself personally, I would hate, you know, speaking about homelessness, um, speaking with a college student who's like never experienced homelessness in the past, who's never had a split family, who's never had to worry a day in their life about when they're going to eat or where they're going to sleep at, as opposed to someone who is African American as myself, and also like, you know, having experiences with homelessness. Um, so that they could be able to better um, cement the relationship um, and it, it creates trust. Um, and it's that kind of cultural connection that then goes into long lasting relationships because then this is someone that you are motivated to speak to or be around or to hear from all the time. Um, so that's where that long lasting relationship comes in. And number three, which is like peer mentors for service navigation and advocacy is instrumental and that's where I am literally the embodiment of that whole point um, because as soon as I became like this public ally for all these other young people um, in New York City it became easier for me to be able to contact them it became easier for me to create meetings um, and for me to be able to find where young people were because they were comfortable with myself coming into the spaces that they have for themselves because I was like them and I still am. Um, and that's why peer mentorship is, is especially important because there's things that a young person will discuss with a peer that they won't discuss with a staff member for ethical and obvious reasons. Um, and then also being someone who's been within the New York system before, I definitely have like an in-depth way of like navigating that system as opposed to a way of a social worker who's just coming in and not exactly sure about what would be the next step after they've encountered an issue or a young person of this particular experience. Um, professional development for peer navigators to be able to assimilate into this role is especially important um, because what you will find is that initially when a young person starts to go into spaces around peer navigation, they're not going to necessarily know how to articulate certain things or how to um, basically ensure that everybody in the room has a level of understanding of what they're saying. So professional development not only allows them to know the abbreviations, to know the terms, um, and to kind of know how the system operates on a service level, and but then also you're you're exercising that thin line between exploitation and empowerment, because exploiting is you just using that young person's experience to kind of prove why it is that you need funding, or prove why it is that you need this program, or prove why it is that you need this particular deliverable or whatever it may be, but you tying professional development is now you empowering that young person because one, you are you're still using their like personal experience, but then you are allowing them to be able to articulate and effectively communicate how that experience can create a solution for someone else who may be going through the same thing at the ending. Um, and then I would tie that within like always asking what a young person needs because I think like myself in several situations and being very human, um, we have personal biases. And sometimes when we're met with like a particular decision, you know, innately we would think, oh, this is gonna be the best option for you. But regardless of that may being the best option or not, you still are assuming um, and not necessarily asking if that's what that young person needs. So that's why it's very specific that you should ask, um, regardless of whether or not you may know what decision may bring whatever outcome. And also being transparent about which of those needs you may or may not be able to provide. The worst thing to do with any young person, and this is also towards myself, um, and that's how I communicate with my previous case managers in the past and a few other people that I've worked with is, let me know what you can and cannot do. 
because the minute that you you've kind of given me all this power or you've said that you can do all these things and then being told that I can't do it, what in turn happens is like my trust goes away. Um, and I may be in a better place to understand why that couldn't have happened and be able to move on. But there's so many other young people who, with all the other issues they're dealing with on a daily basis, now to hear that they can't trust the person that they've tried to you know, put their trust in is, 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 is tarnished. So therefore, they're not going to have that trust, maybe not even towards the entire agency, because now you have not only represented yourself, but you've represented this agency, and you will have now a snowballing effect of like these flaws and inconsistencies with your program. Um, so transparency is really, really important. And I know that Kendon, um, having worked with Kendon for a short period of time, like they've exhausted all these like strategies and all these like practices with me. And that's why I know that there's no other person that's ideal for the job that they're doing because they're like super perfect with like fine tuning how it is to work with me and work with the young people that they've been doing. Uh, and then Kendon, I'll allow you to chime into the mentoring strategies. Thanks, Guy. Great point. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, this is Kendon and um, Sky. I swear I did not pay Sky to say that, Sky. So I appreciate that. That was not in talking points, but we do definitely in the the work that I've been doing with um, young leaders <clears throat> try to um, make sure that we are really. Um, mirroring the things that um, we want to see. So if we are hoping for um, young people to develop into leaders and into professionals and in, um, to be successful um, in their goals and their endeavors, that it's critical um, that we're both providing opportunities and support and being willing to take the back seat and share power in that process. Um, and we'll talk more about that um, later on in the session. So um, many, if you don't mind going to the next slide, um, then I'll hand it back to you, or I'm sorry, yeah, and that's perfect. So um, so a couple things that were already mentioned by Carissa and Skye, um, but I just wanted to highlight in connection with the research is that, um, you know, research over and over again says mentoring builds protective factors, um, and it really models that healthy relationship. And when we think about um, young people who have had trauma in within relationships with other people, um, particularly if you think about um, childhood abuse, which um, Dusty Ann mentioned at the beginning, um, that's very prevalent with survivors, um, mixed to those early traumatic relationships and then the uh, trauma that comes with exploitation, um, mentoring can really provide that model of what is a healthy relationship. What are those healthy boundaries? What does it mean for someone to care about me without strings? Um, and that might be the first time they've really experienced that. Um, it also can provide support outside of the system. A lot of times us as staff members or as paid professionals, um, we represent the system whether we intend to or not. Um, when young people have had sometimes negative experiences or even trauma within systems and services. And so a mentor can really be that bridge um, where it's this person who's not paid, you know, and sometimes mentors are paid, but um, there's this sort of person who's not um, uh, inside the system, or at least, you know, from perception, that they're able to be that bridge and be like, you know, I get it, and I don't have the same boundaries as, like, a program director might. Um, and also support in navigating family and navigating services, just expanding support networks and social capital overall. So um, we know that our, our friends and our families and our, our people, those connections really help us moving forward in life, um, as much as we say young people, we want them to be independent, it's also that um, none of us are truly independent. You know, we're all interdependent on each other um, in, in everything that we do. And um, also just uh, increased self-esteem, new ex exposure to new experiences and skills. Um, and a great quote, um, if, if you are familiar with Karen Pittman, but problem-free is not fully prepared. So we can say all day that we want to save someone, we want to fix them, we want to um, eliminate their problems, we want to, um, you know, reduce uh, substance abuse, we want to, all of those things. Um, but that doesn't mean that a young person, because you eliminate those things, they're prepared to be successful in um, in work and career and relationships and in life. And so we have to look beyond just um, eliminating problems to looking at how do we really 
um, prepare young people to be successful and to thrive. Um, and many, if you can flip to the next slide, thanks. And so um, one of the most, like the favorite quotes that I have around this topic, um, it's from the National Mentoring Resource Center, actually, um, David Dubois and uh, Jennifer Fellner. Um, they said, you know, while mentoring might provide foster, or sorry, it might foster cognitive, social, emotional, um, my, um, foster cognitive, social, emotional, and identity development in youth, really, for these young people, their most valuable role might be in serving as the glue to help them engage with other services and support. Um, again, that kind of outside the system, somebody that like, I'm just really on your team. Whatever we're going through, wherever we're going, I'm with you. I've got your back. Um, and that can really help be that bridge with other um, services that are going to help the young person um, be uh, be more successful and, and in that healing process. Um, I, I won't um, speak to this slide, but I will just say it's here. So this is one of the um, uh, only studies, actually. There's a, a lit review here. Um, there's not a lot of research about um, mentoring for this um, specific population, but there are a few things. Um, and I think the previous quote really captured the main um, summary of this, but here's some other points from that research as well. And um, as I mentioned earlier, mentoring really um, helps build protective factors. And we can think about all of those risk factors that we've heard about for young people um, being sexually exploited. Um, but what we can also really focus on is how do we and how do mentors specifically build protective factors. And we know that in addition to the connections to those other services, that just healthy relationships in themselves with and that model of a caring adult um, as well as the networks that that caring adult brings with them can really um, increase all of these different protective factors. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone, for all of your great thoughts about um, relationships being at the heart of um, assisting youth around this issue. And obviously, that's what we're all about in mentoring. So we wanted to spend a good amount of time <clears throat> on that topic. Apologies to the audience that I accidentally broadcast at a, a chat that was meant for the organizers. <clears throat> so just really want to re-encourage any of your questions. Um, we will have time for questions. We're running a little behind on time, but we will have time for some questions. So keep them rolling in. I see some really good ones coming in already, and we'll address as many as we can. Um, and we're going to move on now to the topic of trauma and how that is relevant to exploitation. And I just want to say one word really quickly about that, um, which is that you know, in our field of mentoring, we talk a lot about trauma and trauma-informed mentoring. And so we wanted to address that specifically in relation to exploitation. And um, in talking with the panelists before the session, one thing that was mentioned is that in the, in the services field addressing CSEC, um, a lot of the discussion around trauma is also raising a discussion around how much uh, the goal is to uh, sort of rescue or um, convince youth who are being exploited to leave their situations versus provide harm reduction for them while they're staying in their situations. Obviously, we want to make sure youth aren't being exploited, but sometimes the efforts to rescue are causing more backlash and, and uh, breaking down connection rather than building up connection. So I just wanted to alert the audience that there's a big debate, and, or I don't know if debate's the right word, but there's a lot of discussion right now in the C-Sex field about the role of harm reduction, and you may hear some of that from our presenters today, but it's something you might want to look into on your own as well. So um, uh, we want to go next to Sky and Kendon to talk a little bit about what your recommendations are for trauma-informed practices when doing mentoring with um, youth who are either especially at risk of CSEC or um, have experienced it. Take it away. Great. Thank you so much for giving me the floor again. Um, so what you will see um, had we when we spoke about relationships um, and trauma informed practices, you'll see like a few overlaps, meaning like everything fundamentally works with each other. So one thing does affect the other. Um, so again, we see ensuring that youth have control and decision making power in their lives, which is autonomy. So in other words, what that looks like is ensuring that you're always checking in with that young person about what does success actually look like for them. I think, you know, with all the 
deliverables that we have to meet and kind of like the ethical policies that we have to you do, you know, we kind of often determine what that success looks like for a young person. And then when they haven't met that success, you know, we therefore punish that young person or make that young person feel like they haven't really did what they were supposed to do. When the only thing that we are meant to do is to find out what their success is and helping them get that. Um, and that's how you create control and decision making problems and decision-making power within a young person. Also, it may simply mean as you altering your schedule to accommodate that young person where it's not that young person always trying to make him or herself or they self available for your schedule when you're being paid to um, ensure that they're doing the best that they can do. Um, the second point is understanding the experiences of youth and systems and services, avoiding re-traumatization. Yes. There's several instances where, you know, you could possibly say to this young person, you're not trying hard enough or you're not being hard enough. You maybe want to keep a check of how it is that you do speak to a young person and the tone and the what words you may use, because all of these are different characteristics of how someone can be re-traumatized. You're dealing with, especially like someone um, who's engaged in sex work before, having to not meet the status quo or being told that you're not sexy enough or good looking enough or so on, only to go into a space where you know you're not supposed to be judged or you're not supposed to be um, told those things. So you are reading, being greeted with that kind of like hostility again. Um, and then it also kind of like changes when you realize that these decisions that a young person makes or these activities that a young person may get involved in is not their fault. And like, it's called exploitation for a reason. Um, and once it is that you've recognized that, then your tone and your level of understanding of the system will become a lot different because then you wanna ensure that they're not getting the same experience that they've gotten in the past. And then when that has changed, then you will no longer have a recycling of themselves into each of these different systems. Um, avoiding approaches that are focused on helping, saving, and fixing. Yes. Again, with our personal biases about how it is that you feel that this solution may fix this, or this solution may help that, or this solution may save this person. Regardless of what it is that you do, it's ultimately the decision of that young person in what they will decide to do and how they decide to move forward. I just think as a social worker or as a peer mentor or someone supporting that young person, it's a kind of like explain all the different options and then also take the time to recognize the consequences and pros with each of those decisions and let them be the one to decide that because your only role here is to ensure that hey if it is that you've made this decision here's what may come good of it and here's what may not come good of it and then allow that young person to make that decision you're not trying to help them you're not trying to fix them you're not trying to save them you're really just doing your job of providing whatever it is that they need. And that is trauma-informed services in this context. Um, utilizing alternatives to detainment or criminalization. Like, no, I noticed that for certain communities, we've, in, we've started the, the HUD Housing First module, and that basically does not allow like providers to necessarily shun or discharge someone from a housing because they were simple disagreement or there was a fight or something like that. So yeah, this kind of module is basically just not like, you know, recriminalizing a young person because they're acting in the way that they've adopted to act or they're acting in a way that they've seen as the best way to act. You're more sure trying to understand why and then provide solutions, not detain or criminalize. Um, while doing all this, uh, you're also ensuring that basic needs are met, meaning stable housing and safety. And also, if it is that you are not able to provide these basic needs, then you want to ensure that you've created a referral system that has these basic needs in other places, but actually know a point of contact, actually know someone that you can call on the phone right now and say, hey, I have a young person who's in need of like housing tonight. May you be able to assist? Actually know the programs and services that you're referring to young people um, because it's actually counterproductive to refer someone else when they're getting less or no services at all from someone 
who you're contacting with or like you're sending them to. So it goes just beyond the scope of what your agency does. Um, okay. And then focus on wellness rather than labels. Oh, okay, my bad. So yeah, focus on wellness rather than labels and diagnosis. And diagnosis. Um, I think when you're dealing with trauma-informed um, practices, you're not a psychiatrist, unless it is that you are certified to be. Neither are you like a psychologist. So therefore, you're going to refrain or you're not going to necessarily use, oh, I think you may have a mental illness. Or I think, no, that's not your focus here. It's just kind of like just telling young people to ensure that they're doing what they need to do to take care of themselves. I think the furthest this needs to go is maybe explaining like, you know, the principle of exploding and imploding and how doing things of that nature may not necessarily be as well to you, and then recommending, oh, well, you could do meditation, or there's an option for therapy, or there's the option, give them different options of self-care matters, but then also don't choose which one is best for them. Let them decide that for themselves. All um, right. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. <clears throat> Yeah, no, if you want to close off your thought, I didn't mean to interrupt. We need to move on to the next presenter, but go ahead and close up. Sure. Okay, great. Um, Kenda, did you have a couple words to add about that before we go to Carissa? Um, no, actually, Dusty, and I really feel like um, Sky's points were, were like, included everything that I could have possibly said. So thanks for that, Sky. <clears throat> ah, wonderful. Yeah, no, I agree. That was really well said. Thanks, Sky. Carissa, um, so do you want to say um, we have about two or three minutes for you to talk a little bit about a trauma-informed approach to mentoring? Okay. Just quickly remembering where uh, we are with trauma-informed approach. The numbering might be off, but, you know, we have these uh, basic principles behind trauma-informed approach. So remembering that as we build a mentoring program or adapt our mentoring program for CSEC youth, all of these apply, um, how they might apply. You might want to even have youth um, start thinking start thinking from the youth perspective. So um, about these things, um, I'm not sure which slide we're on now. Relational impact of commercial. Okay, so we can move on to the next one if you want. We we know that there's a relational impact. I I put on some slides that I think especially the newer mentors would want to look at just to get the perspective again from. I try to bring myself back to that moment when no one understood me and I felt like there was this giant wall between me and the world because of the things that had happened to me. So just I put in some statements when I'm channeling back to that place, you know, about things that I might have been thinking about and that could give you a good perspective to come from um, when you're looking at forming a trauma-informed approach. Um, yes? So um, okay, it's important great. to note that just because I feel like there's a wall between you and me doesn't mean that I'm not strong and that I don't feel strong. I also know that I learn pretty fast. These are things that you can focus on that are really positive, especially with CSEC youth. You know, um, there's a lot of strength that gets exploited. There's learning. We, we're very fast learners. We know how to engage quickly. We read people quickly, typically. These are the reasons why we're targeted to be exploited is because those 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 strengths and skills and talents that we have can be exploited easily in, in CSEC. So um, understand that, you know, you don't have to put on necessarily, you don't have to treat someone as if they're a full broken person all the time. You really try to look at the strengths because that's what the trafficker is doing and try to look at the strengths and build them up from there. So um, I, I included those kind of perspectives as well. And um, this quote that you all can just put up everywhere um, around you and understand that we're more alike than we are different. And I don't think that youth always understand that when they see us, if we don't look like them or talk like them or act like them, that we still have our own experiences and it's drawing from those experiences and challenges in our own life where we can be most relatable. Thank you, Carissa. Really, really uh, insightful thoughts, and thanks so much for sharing from your own experience about that. And we were talking about sort of the, tra the trauma aspect and, and really be sensitive to that. And then you also took us into our next um, topic, which was really about um, 
about doing youth informed and youth led services that recognize strengths. And many if you could go back a couple of slides to our intro to this section. Um, yeah, this one. So, oh no, sorry, back one more. Oh no, this is right, sorry. Um, so you're right, sorry, sorry. Um, so yeah, we, we brainstormed as a group about what do we mean by a strengths-based perspective and how to be youth-driven and survivor-led. And here are some, some approaches to that. I know that lots of mentoring programs out there look for ways to really uh, build on strengths and see our young people as more than just walking problems and really understand what's unique and valuable about them and ways to bring in their voices into programming and give them leadership opportunities. So these were some strategies we came up with um, on that. Kenan and Sky, one, or, one minute or so each, anything you wanna add about a strengths-based perspective and a youth-led perspective? Um, this is Sky here. Um, I'm thinking that you know, only if I had one point, just ensure that if you are evaluating a service, if it's like youth led or youth informed, ensure that the young people are behind that evaluation, I would think. Um, I think a lot of the times young people are just engaged when things are going really well, or young people are engaged, like, you know, like when the funder is around. And I think that no, young people should always be evaluating a service, especially if it's involving a young person's perspective or opinion. Wonderful. Kendon, anything to add? You know, I think the um, the one thing that I would just um, share, I think here's um, this slide illustrates just some strategies in doing that. And this is something also that our Youth Catalyst team members provide training and technical assistance around for organizations. Um, but uh, I would just say that um, have young people at the table in developing the leadership opportunities themselves because also they can tell you um, what what they need, what you know, where their strengths are, what they're interested in, um, and then understand that like all of that both deepens the understanding of the organization of what are those needs and trends, and it um, increases the youth engagement in the program because they believe that they have power and a voice, and um, and we're all getting old. You know, like us as adults, and we have to prepare for that succession, right? Those, those, um, preparing for those transitions in leadership. And so we've mm -hmm. got to um, understand that those young people are going to be the CEOs um, very soon. And, Great point. Uh, that's all. So, Dusty, and I'll, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Definitely with you on the getting old factor. I feel you there. So, um, this is a good time to mention, by the way, people, and people in the chat box are asking a lot about resources, training. You are welcome to contact any of our presenters. Um, Runaway Girl does do trainings, et cetera, and Youth Collaboratory has a great new toolkit out that they did in, in partnership with the Center for Combating Human Trafficking at Wichita State. Um, that is, we have the link here. Also, OJJDP has a whole page of programs and resources for uh, on this topic. So please do seek out additional resources in your area or contact our presenters for that. And with that, we'd like to move to some questions from our uh, from our listeners. Jerry Shirk is with us today. Jerry, what do you see coming up in the in the questions box? Um, they were slow at first, and now they came pouring in. So um, we must apologize for not getting to all of them. But there's some very interesting questions. Um, the first one I'm going to throw out there to any of the panelists is how can you help a youth whose trafficker provides more safety and stability than the string of abusive foster homes that the youth is fleeing? Mm -hmm. Excellent Who wants question. to answer that one? Oh, hey, Carissa, well, you're cutting out a little bit. Um, you're cutting out a little bit. Does somebody else want to jump in? Sorry. And Carissa, maybe you can. No, that's okay. I think we can hear you now. Are you there? Oh, yeah, still cutting out. You may want to call back in. Um, Kendon or, or Sky, do you have a thought about that? Um, do you mind repeating the question one more time, please? Yeah, so the question was, how can you help a youth whose trafficker provides more safety and stability than the string of abusive foster homes that they are fleeing? Uh, I think it's, it's, it's 
it's also being honest and I, again you know being transparent that you know there's a lot of like ethical clause and a lot of like um kind of like behind the scene issues that a, a that a service provider has to like deal with in a way that sometimes may not be in the best interest of a young person but then also being very clear that you should not be exploited for getting those services providing that they're available to you and we can get them to you in a way where you don't have to exchange your body for that and i think just simply saying that um kind of like gets their attention because at the end of the day regardless of whether or not they feel like this exploiter is giving them what they need they're still being exploited to get it and there's a side or a part of them that knows that they shouldn't have to do that and knows that it's wrong um, and once it is that you can incorporate motivational interviewing to kind of figure out what are those immediate needs or what are those things that the exploit is providing, you immediately are going to start to find solutions or other alternatives to getting those things where that person doesn't feel like they need that exploited to provide that anymore. And that's my recommendation there. Thanks, thanks, guys. Thank and so also, yeah. Chris, Chris, Chris uh, Jumped, jumped in there in the chat, and she said uh, you also have to, to let the young people uh, know about their rights and to have them contact a, an attorney that the youth has rights to be protected and needs to know that. So thank you. So another question, um, we actually had a couple juvenile probation officers ask the same question, and then somebody else who may be a case manager. So. Uh, for anybody out there, uh, any panelists, any tips specifically for juvenile probation officers? And then another person said, what are some ways that someone in a mentor role can get a youth that, that are or have experienced trauma to gain trust in you while you're also doing your job? So I guess it's kind of about changing changing hats. Dusty Ann, do you want to take that one? Uh, I mean, I'd rather our presenters do. Anybody want to take okay. that one? Um, this is Kendra, and I, I definitely um, can speak to that a little bit. Um, you know, so I think a, a big thing just about engagement and trust in general is, um, you know, as Sky mentioned earlier, just that transparency. I think it's also, um, you know, really important that, um, you are able to sort of be nimble in your role. Um, and I think particularly if you're affiliated with the justice system at all, um, that can be a really sensitive um, sensitive area for young people and there may have been trauma associated with that. And so um, more than anything, you have to establish yourself as a safe person and as a person that um, is not out to get them or trick them. And I think that um, coming in the door, most young people, most survivors are going to have the expectation that that's, your, that's what you're going to do. And so everything that you can do to, uh, de, um, to sort of flip that narrative and to be able to um, build trust and be honest and um, let them know up front where those boundaries are. Hey, if this, this, and this happens, I have to do this. And it not be a surprise or a trick because that is the number one thing that will happen in terms of sabotaging trust. Great. Great. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, can I can I just add? Is, can you guys hear me better now, or is it still cutting out? Yeah. No, you're great. Thanks, Carissa. Okay. So, in terms of not being that promising to do everything for them and try to be all. I think a lot of programs go out full force and try to be everything to, to one person and, and they're not. And I think being open and upfront about building connections in the community and resources that they have access to and building bridges to, as uh, Sky pointed out, programs that you already know and you've spent time going out and learning about. When there's a downtime for you, that's really time to go out into your community and learn um, and connect so that you can be a connector. So that that builds, I think that just goes to the long-term success again, also that Kendon had pointed out. Great, and thank you. There's, there's, there's also a lot of questions about uh, materials. Um, one from Robin, I'm about to start matching children who have experienced trauma through physical and sexual abuse. I'm wondering if there's a program that has forms 
training materials, pre and post evaluations. I've been a coordinator for 18 years, but this is a new population. So there's several questions about that and questions about are there toolkits available for working with this population. Uh, Carissa, are you knowledgeable about yeah. any of those? Um, there are quite a few tool toolkits and uh, things available, and it's really knowing your own community as well and your community resources again. So you're tapped into that already if you've been running your program for 18 years. So reaching out to them and finding out who's already running maybe uh, commercial sexual exploitation, you know, CSEC or adult program even, uh, whether it's housing resources. Um, and there are so many organizations out there that already serve CSEC and just haven't ne necessarily named their program for it yet. So tapping into all of that is a, is a good start and then training your mentors how to access all of those resources as well. Um, working closely with the court system to both at the dependency and also delinquency court system to so you prior built that those relationships up as well uh, is critical for, for CSEC youth as well. Maybe not for all populations that you're mentoring, but for CSEC youth for sure. Great. This is Kendra. I, I wanted to add just oh sorry. Yeah, please, Kendra, go ahead. Yeah, um, I just wanted to add one thing is that, um, well, I guess two things. One is that um, there are a number of organizations, you saw the um, slide with the resources um, in the OJJDP um, link. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, the organizations that do mentoring for CSEC, um, the project that I um, am the lead of TA on, um, in terms of a lot of the agencies in that project, we've worked with them to develop some of the, like you're saying, policies and procedures and the um, the plan for supporting mentors and training and things like that. And so um, I can, I mean, there is the option of connecting with one of those organizations um, with uh, some of those resources. And we're about to release some more public um, templates and resources as well. And you'll find some of these things in that toolkit for samples and such. Great, thank you. Um, here's another question that came in. Uh, as a mandated reporter, how do you regain trust after they have opened up to you and, and whatever they opened up with has to be reported? Any of our panelists? Um, so there's a lot of controversy about mandated, mandated reporting and how you handle that. There's some people who say up front in every meeting they have with the youth, you know, I'm a mandated reporter, and so anything you tell me will be reported. But really, I try to get that over with in the first time. If I'm if I if I tell mandated reporters, you know, if you're a mandated reporter, just go ahead and establish that when you establish a relationship up front. And then when someone's sharing something with you, if you break it, if you break up their share with the statement, well, remember that I'm a mandated reporter. That's going to make them stop sharing by and large, almost every single time, it's a signal to them that you don't want to hear the rest of what they have to say. Um, so I would just be really cautious in, um, in how you do that and really reading the moment. And then as far as when and how to, you know, if you're a mandated reporter, I think doing refresher trainings on that regularly is great. And then CSEC is, is usually a part of that now as well for almost every jurisdiction that I've been working in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Thank yeah, you. Good thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, there's a lot of approaches to that question. I think um, mm -hmm. it's worth spending time in your program to really process how to do that. I think Carissa's is right that it's tough to interrupt a share, but you do have to be upfront from the beginning. And I think there's different approaches to that. So more than we can fully address today, but really good to raise the question. And um, so I want to thank everybody. Uh, we have time. Uh, we have time for literally like one sentence from each of you on our closing thoughts and I think that's worth doing and then we'll be out of here um, with some housekeeping slides to follow. So literally one sentence we wanted to hear from each presenter something that you have to say about how we can tackle sort of the environmental causes of and perpetuations of, um, of uh, exploitation instead of just thinking about helping young people adapt to a bad situation. So let's start with uh, Kendon, one sentence. Um, yeah, sure. For me, I think this is, um, it's critical to really look at the intersections and sort of um, systemic oppression and, and how equity plays a role in that. 
And so the, um, the vulnerabilities around, you know, race and sexual orientation and gender identity and all of those things um, have to play into what our interventions and our approaches are to doing this work. Yes, absolutely. Um, Carissa, one sentence on, on the environment. Someone said to me once, uh, and it was really important, and I want to say to all of you, especially the new mentors, that you have potential in all these fronts. You have potential. Great, thanks. And Sky, how about you? Oh, we may have lost Sky. Um, Okay, well, uh, really great uh, thoughts. No, Sky, Sky, oh. Sky is Sky still here. I'm definitely okay. still here. I just muted myself because I wanted to be respectful. I realized that a lot of people are speaking, so I wanted to also talk to you. But I'm still here, though. I'm still listening. Thank you. And I want to okay. send special thanks to all the people who participated. Thank you, Sky. And I just really want to thank our panelists um, for bringing such heart to the work and uh, personal and professional experiences. You're all doing such wonderful work out there. And thank our audience for taking an interest in this really important topic. And we're closing for today. I'm going to do some housekeeping as we close out. Um, mentor, so remember uh, that one week after the webinar, you'll all receive an email with a link to uh, the web page where we'll have the recording and slides from today. We also really want your feedback, so please, at the end of the webinar, answer our short survey to make the series even better. And you can stay connected by visiting our page on the Mentor website. It has archives of all the past and upcoming webinars. And please join us next month on September 19th for our webinar on mentoring to and through college. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day, and let's uh, protect our youth from being exploited wherever we can. Thanks so much.